It's really sort of a miracle that the UFC even exists. 30 years since its creation, we take it for granted. I mean, at this point, it's practically an American institution with former presidents regularly attending. But at the turn of the millennium, the premier mixed martial arts promotion in the world was on its last leg, hemorrhaging money, languishing in obscurity, and breathing its final breaths. It's truly an incredible story how it ever managed to dig itself out of its own grave and reach the heights it has today. A story full of of unlikely heroes who brought it back from the brink and saved this sport at a time when its potential wasn't even fathomable. Get some snacks and a blanket. Uncle Tommy from MMA On Point's gonna tell you a story about the year the UFC almost died. Massive shout out to the Channel Hall of Famers for making this one possible. All right, are you all settled in? Good. Our story starts and ends at UFC 27, an event that was headlined by Pedro Hizo TKOing Dan Severn in just 93 seconds in his last bout in the octagon. And event held deep in the American South at an arena that's max capacity was less than 9,000, but they certainly didn't need that much space. An event that should have and very well could have been the last the promotion ever put on, some six years and ten months after the seminal first show at the McNichol Sports Arena in Denver. The only guy who was involved in UFC 1 that was still involved in UFC 27 was, ironically enough, Bob Myrowitz from Semaphore Entertainment Group, the 50-50 partner that produced that first ever card for Horry and Gracie and and our Davy. We're going to make this like real fighting. We're going to see how these different martial arts work in real fighting, and we're going to make it as real as possible. Bob bought out Horian and Art after UFC 5 and had been fitting the bill ever since. Myrowitz wasn't even from the fight game. He didn't get into this to evangelize Gracie Jiu Jitsu or to change hearts and minds about martial arts. He was a music guy that saw a good opportunity to make money in pay-per-view and rode with it. But here he was at UFC 27, the only one left. And now they were dead broke. SCG literally didn't have enough money to put on the next event. That was it. This was the end. But as Jim Ross would say, anytime Triple H did something dastardly during the Attitude Era, but why? Why was UFC 27 going to be the end? Or more importantly, why was the promotion that so sensationally brought MMA into the mainstream consciousness in the United States completely broke? Well, to answer that question, we're going to need to go back a bit further than the year 2000. Here's the thing, given the size and the scope of the UFC now, it's hard to understand just how successful the earliest events the promotion put on truly were, but they were getting pay-per-view buy rates ranging from 100k to 300k most of the time. The Ultimate Fighting Championship was a hit, and its audience was growing. Even in those early stages, they were the brand almost entirely synonymous with no-holds-barred events in popular culture. They were the Coca-Cola of cage fighting, but a huge part of that success was initially built on marketing that sensationalized the violence. So, as this popular myth of MMA being ultra-violent, no-rules barbarism seeped into the popular consciousness in the United States via the success of the UFC, we found ourselves in a good old moral panic. As early as 1994, Arizona Senator John McCain was criticizing footage of UFC 2 at a Senate hearing. Some of it is so brutal that uh, it nauseates people, uh, even hardened individuals uh, are repelled by this. A less talked about early opponent of the sport was Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell of Colorado, who was not too hot on the first two UFC cards being held in his state. McCain would start his letter-writing campaign in 1995, urging every governor of every state to ban no-holds-barred competitions. After Charlotte, North Carolina's second UFC event, the city council banned MMA, calling it a form of pornography. After the Ultimate Ultimate in Denver, Colorado took action to ban the sport. The Puerto Rican government tried to stop UFC 8 but lost in court. The rules for UFC UFC 9 were famously changed at the last minute. We were fighting every minute for the life of this organization, the life of this sport. I went to court every place we went. We were doing a show in Rhode Island and the judge says, you can do it here in Rhode Island as long as you follow the rules of the WWE. My lawyer gets up and says, your honor, WWE is not real. And the judge says, I've been watching it for 20 years, it is real. And while all of this was chipping away at SEG's business and they were spending more time in the courtroom than they were in arenas, what really set this whole thing off is what happened in New York. Because Denver and Charlotte, those aren't major markets. New York is the biggest sports market in the entire country. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, as Frank used to say. And the UFC already had. Well, kinda. Their seventh card was in Buffalo. It was their highest attended event at the time with 9,000 fans. But Buffalo is not New York City. Short 
shortly after the UFC's first successful show in the state, a different promotion that was looking to put on their first ever event called Battlecade Extreme Fighting booked the Park Slope Armory in Brooklyn and created a firestorm. Immediately, Governor George Pataki and Mayor Rudy Giuliani called for a banning of no-holds-barred events in the state. They would find a loophole by having the Division of Military and Naval Affairs, who had control of the facility, kick Battlecade out of the venue. Overnight, they would head to North Carolina, just not Charlotte, of course. The close call had political elite in New York fired up, and legislation to ban no-holds-barred events outright was drafted. But SEG being a New York-based company knew that a ban in New York would be a death sentence for the sport. And so they hired a well-known lobbyist, paid them 45 grand, and amazingly got the two chambers of the New York Senate to vote so completely in their favor that Governor Pataki had no choice but to sign the bill into law as they had the numbers to override a veto attempt. It was a huge win for Meyerowitz and cage fighting. I mean, we're talking about the biggest sports market in the country being the first state to officially recognize and sanction mixed martial arts in the mid-90s. You know John McCain was just punching the air when he read about it in the New York Times. The UFC worked closely with the state, and the plan was to put on a series of shows in places like Buffalo, lesser towns outside the Big Apple first. Then, once enough shows had been run clean, they could try for somewhere in New York City, a way to ease the concerns of citizens. See, they've already successfully run shows all around the state and nobody got hurt. That's when Battlecade fucked it all up again. With this new law on the books, Battlecade Extreme Fighting was back, and they were going to try for a New York City show yet again. They, however, were not working with the state like the UFC. As far as they were concerned, the law was the law, and they were going to legally put on an event. Pataki and Giuliani were having none of it. They used their cachet to completely flip the state's legislators. Suddenly, everybody that was so in favor of the law and regulation wanted MMA banned immediately. But the clock was ticking and the wheels of government are slow. The UFC's first show since the law went into effect in Niagara Falls was approaching, as was Battlecade's NYC card. So the state decided if they couldn't overturn the law in time, they would just make doing a show literally impossible. And they did that through the Athletic Commission, who created a ton of new rules in order for an MMA bout to take place. They wanted headgear. They wanted it to be in a boxing ring. The judge ruled that it's someone's life is in danger, so therefore, for the first time ever in the history of New York State, they're going to make a rule that it's an emergency rule to save someone's life, we are banned from New York State. So SEG fought it in court, but lost the day before the card, and literally had to move everything overnight to Dothan, Alabama. How fitting that that event would be called Judgment Day, because that is indeed what it was. The UFC had been doomed. The entire fiasco in New York was covered at length by the national paper of record, the New York Times, and that coverage only bolstered the campaign against the sport nationwide. Three weeks after UFC 12, New York officially banned mixed martial arts. By UFC 27, the event we started our story on, 37 states had bans on MMA, and the three major pay-per-view providers in the United States, Cablevision, TCI, and Time Warner, had all refused to do business with any MMA promotion. Only smaller brands like Direct TV Satellite would carry them, shrinking the potential size of their audience to almost nothing. The UFC didn't have money for home distribution anymore either, so VHS and DVD sales had halted. The only money they could make to try to offset their costs was the gate at the venues they could afford and that would have them, and the nearly non-existent pay-per-view buys. The UFC had been dealt a death blow in New York in 1997. The next three years, they would be the walking dead, slowly hobbling along to their inevitable end, removed from the popular consciousness, just looking for a shady tree to lie under until the darkness took them. Which isn't to say that Bob Meyerowitz was going to go out without a fight. He knew the UFC was a winner. They were on fire in those early days. If the bans were lifted, he knew the thing could take off yet again. He just had to survive long enough to get them there. This was all my money, and I'm sorry to say I didn't have Fertitta money. Following Judgment Day, the goal was simple. Get mixed martial arts regulated in one of these states with a major boxing commission. California, New York, New Jersey, or in a best case scenario, Nevada, the fight capital of the world. If Meyerowitz could get MMA regulated there, that was it. That was the key. The pay-per-view providers would come back and the money would roll in. And so the promotion went forward trying to make this all happen. They would regulate themselves and lobby as much as they could afford until a 
commission deemed them acceptable. UFC 12 had already seen the implementation of weight classes as per that New York law. UFC 14 would see the standardization and requirement of gloves. By UFC 15, there were a ton of new rules on the books about illegal strikes. Headbutts, knees to a ground opponent, groin strikes, all that fun stuff was out. UFC 17, no more one-night tournaments, and we're not calling it cage fighting or no holds barred or anything else with an already negative connotation. This is mixed martial arts. You can thank commentator Jeff Blatnick for that. You can also thank Blatnick for creating the official 16-page UFC rulebook in June of 1999 that much further specified the scoring criteria, implemented the 10-point must system, specified that title bouts would be five five-minute rounds, regular bouts three five-minute rounds, and prelims two five-minute rounds. It also included the very first ever testing policy for the sport. And while it is incredibly lax by today's standards, as in they didn't even test for steroids at all, it was still a start and created negative consequences for a fail. All this hard work to make the sport safer and more palatable paid off massively as the UFC managed to get a hearing with the Nevada State Athletic Commission about regulation. Unfortunately, this hearing would never take place. Now, according to Meyerowitz, he'd hired a lobbyist, just as he had in New York, to help him make this all happen, and it worked again. He was told they had the votes needed to get MMA sanctioned in Nevada, but he would get called at midnight the night before the hearing by the lobbyist, telling him that one of the commissioners had backed out and that it would be better to cancel the hearing than to have regulation rejected. And do you know who the, the name of that member would have been to change his mind? Yes, I do. Can you I say do. it or, or no? No. Okay, let's not say it. While Bob is tight-lipped on who the commissioner was nowadays, he was not during a CNBC documentary in 2007 where he named future UFC owner Lorenzo Fertitta, who was on the commission at the time. It turns out that commission was Lorenzo Fertitta, that he had changed his mind and that we wouldn't be able to get approval. This resulted in Zufa's legal team forcing CNBC to retract that portion of the interview. But while Bob's version of the story is sexier for sure, it doesn't seem to line up with the information we have about that hearing. By many other accounts, the meeting was meant as an exploratory exercise. There was never a plan for a vote on that day, nor were all but one commissioner positive about regulation. After the failed date, commissioners including Lorenzo did begin regularly attending UFC events in order to form a relationship with the UFC and better understand stand MMA and whether they would want to sanction it, which led to rumors that a vote would happen that summer. But another hearing was never requested by SEG, very likely because Las Vegas media outlets were indicating that the vote would be a no. It should be noted that Fertitta would step down from the commission in August of 2000, as he was appointed to the role of president of Station Casinos. And when Zufa did take over, Nevada didn't instantly vote yes on MMA. The new UFC lobbied for seven months before the commission finally approved. But that's a story for another time. Let's get back to the beginning of our story, UFC 27, the last UFC ever. With no regulators willing to sanction the sport and the money having all dried up, as Goldie would say, it was all over. At least it would have been, if not for two key figures that rarely get mentioned when talking about the UFC's revival. The first and most important is Larry Hazard. Larry was a former boxer and referee. He participated in jiu-jitsu for decades and at the time he was the commissioner of the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board. He truly believed in mixed martial arts. He was a huge fan, and he was able to convince the board to give out a provisional license for the IFL to put on a show in Atlantic City in September of 2000. After that success, he reached out to the UFC about doing the same thing that coming November. They would be sanctioned for three events, and if they went well, the state would consider fully adopting the sport. This was beyond massive. Besides Nevada, New Jersey was the next best possible state to have on board for legitimizing the sport through regulation. There was just the one problem, though. SEG didn't have enough money to put on the show. Enter our second unlikely hero, Dan Lambert. And he just knocked out Dan Lambert of American Top Team! Lambert today is of course best known for being the owner of American Top Team, but in 2000, he was running small shows in Florida, the team was just starting up, and he was making a ton of cash in real estate. SEG got into contact with him and Lambert said that he would fund the event for 200 k but he also wanted a 51% ownership of the company, something he would pay an additional 300 grand for, and he would put a million in escrow for the costs of running the business until the sport could get regulated and things would take back off again. The deal we made was a half a million dollars to Meyerowitz, 
we were buying 51% and I was putting up an additional million bucks as a loan to the company, which would go to fund their losses while they were still trying to get back on paper. SDG really had no choice but to say yes to the terms, and with that 200K infusion, UFC 28 was a go. This was a landmark show. The regulation in New Jersey was beyond crucial to the sport's future in the US, and it was this event that would directly lead to New Jersey creating the unified rules of mixed martial arts, very much of the blueprint of what Jeff Blatnick had created in 1999, a document that would be crucial in bans being lifted across the country. They had done it. The UFC was saved. Kind of. While it's true the UFC would not die in 2000 because of the New Jersey show, they were still in horrible shape, and regulation in Nevada wouldn't come for another year almost. The truth is, the UFC desperately needed way more cash than Dan Lambert had to offer in escrow. In fact, his plan was to downsize the operation considerably, and that is when the best possible thing happened. Myrowitz screwed Dan Lambert. At least according to to Dan Lambert's side of the story. Bob, who by this point was exhausted and just tired of fighting against a system that it seemed he could never beat, was told by Tito Ortiz's manager Dana White that he knew a couple guys with serious cash that might be interested in buying the promotion. He was not at all shocked to find out that it was Frank and Lorenzo Fertitta, mostly because the header of the facts that White sent this information on read Station Casinos, and so Lambert was out. The Fertittas had come in to buy 100% of the company. I didn't like getting screwed on my 200 grand. Two million for everything, which was not really much more than the name, a few contracts, and a wooden octagon. SEG didn't even own the home entertainment distribution rights to the UFC anymore. They had sold that off to Lionsgate. So Zufa had to pay them an additional two million dollars to get those rights after the fact. And that was that. The UFC had been sold and in turn saved. Because it would take the Fertitas tens of millions of dollars, and nearly as much time as the UFC had already existed for the promotion to finally start turning a profit again. Which is why Lambert's UFC would have never worked, or it would have just been a small regional promotion. And so while yes, it is true that Zufa saved the UFC, and they fought for regulation, and they turned it into the juggernaut that it is today, there are some unsung heroes from the old days that had they not kept this thing afloat, Myrowitz, Blatnik, Lambert, Hazard, had they not desperately moved the sport towards regulation themselves, the promotion wouldn't have even been around for the Fertitas to buy up. And so, while 2000 was the year the UFC almost died, it's also the year that it ensured its survival for decades to come. Alright kids, story time is over. A massive thank you to the editor of this video, Max Randall. Please follow him on all his socials, the guy is a stud and a half, and check out his YouTube channel. A huge thanks to our channel champions as well. You guys make this kind of cool stuff possible. If you would like to be a champion too, hit the join button right there under the video. Did you learn anything today from the story that you didn't already know? Sound off in the comments, and thanks for watching guys. Love these deep dives. I will see you on the next one. Come